In early 2019, Robert Pattinson was announced as the new Cape Crusader for Matt Reeves' highly anticipated adaptation, The Batman. And well, the internet, they had thoughts. No! Which is pretty much par for the course whenever someone is cast in a Batman movie or any superhero movie. It's like, Ben Affleck's gonna be Batman. The first one just goes, no! <laughs> and being as Robert Pattinson's most recognizable role to date was this. This is the skin of a killer, Bill. We can understand the initial skepticism. More recently though, that skepticism has shifted to cautious optimism as people have discovered the non-Twilight parts of Pattinson's career. As the movie heads back into production, we thought we'd ask, how did Robert Pattinson go from Twilight to the Batman, and why do we, and a lot of initial haters, now think he's the perfect choice? To do this, we really have to take a look back. Before we examine how Robert Pattinson emerged as the frontrunner in the most coveted superhero role like ever, we have to examine what makes a good superhero on the big screen and how that's evolved over the years. Christopher Reeves really kicked things off with Superman in the late 70s. Yeah, we're really going back that far, but our idea of a modern day superhero really doesn't take effect until the 2000s, when superhero movies dominated the mainstream blockbuster season. Prior to the 2000s, studios looking to cast a superhero or a superhero villain tended to go straight to big name movie stars and just put them in shiny suits. Sometimes those suits had nipples. Studios thought if you're gonna be able to sell these movies to McDonald's and MasterCard, you gotta have big names. And they were right. For the most part, big names equaled big dollars at the box office. But when they assembled the team for the 2000s X-Men, the previous formula for what made a superhero completely, well, mutated. By employing an inventive mix of award winners and prestigious actors with newcomers and not really including any marquee names, X-Men set itself apart from all other superhero movies and it was a huge success. Okay, Halle Berry was a big time star, but she also pretty much told us why she was cast. And a couple of years later, Sam Raimi would take that new casting formula even further with Spider-Man, picking critical darling Tobey Maguire, no marquee name at the time, to play Peter Parker. After 2000, it helped more to have an Oscar nom than a $100 million movie behind you if you wanted a studio to put you in spandex. This is not to say Hollywood abandoned the movie star formula altogether, but as we get into the mid 2000s, that strategy was yielding diminishing returns. And right as the superhero genre is really taking off and studios are rethinking who to cast as their world savers, Robert Pattinson starts acting. Cast as Reese Witherspoon's son in Vanity Fair, yes, the same Reese who would play his love interest just seven years later, which is not weird at all, Pattinson's role for Vanity Fair was unceremoniously cut at the last minute. The casting director for that film reportedly felt so bad that they cast him as the uber-charming Cedric Diggory in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So I was quite glad I got cut in the end. After bouncing around some forgettable indies, in 2007, Robert Pattinson auditioned for the role of Edward Cullen in Twilight. Never expecting it to be a blockbuster hit and thinking it would just be another forgettable indie, Pattinson was then inadvertently thrust into one of the biggest franchises to ever hit tween girls' walls and the pages of Tumblr. For Edward Cullen himself, then Twilight began breaking records in Hall H and at the box office, making Pattinson the exact kind of movie star that would have been perfect for a superhero movie once upon a time. While our pads churned out Twilight sequels and subtly shaded the film and the fandom in interviews every chance he got, did your Twilight experience turn out to be what you expected? Oh. Over in superhero land, something interesting is taking flight. Marvel and Christopher Nolan leaned into the X-Men model by hiring actors, actors, and unknowns, and both start dominating at the box office. Although these are household names now, looking back on the faces of superhero movies from this time, it was more of a who's who of who's that? Back then, Robert Downey Jr. was mostly known for his arrest record, Chris Hemsworth was an Aussie with a barely there Star Trek cameo, Jennifer Lawrence had been nominated for an Oscar, but for a film that was outgrossed by Piranha 3D, and Henry Cavill, before Man of Steel, he was best known for playing the only character to have more bed partners than Henry VIII on the Tudors. But back to our new Batman. 
When Pattinson left the Twilight Zone in 2012 after four films and $3.3 billion at the box office, he could essentially do anything he wanted. And what he wanted to do was work with some of the most innovative indie and avant-garde directors out there. He worked with names like Werner Herzog, David Cronenberg, David Michaud, Claire Denis, James Gray, the Safdie brothers, and Robert Eggers, avoiding anything big budget or high profile. By not auditioning, because he's bad at it, and essentially hounding the directors he admired, Pattinson amassed an impressive filmography of varied roles, as well as critical acclaim and a reputation of someone with taste that many creative directors sought out. This was also the moment that studios started hiring auteur directors to helm superhero films. This was not to say that every effort was the Dark Knight, but in this time frame, the most successful efforts for fans and critics shied away from big movie stars. And yes, we are marking Justice League as a lackluster effort, but we are reserving final judgment until we see the Snyder Cut. If all this auteur stuff is sounding somewhat familiar, let us remind you of these award-winning actors who also eventually chose to play comic book characters. Or at least I think that's what Tom Hardy was doing in Venom. I'm still not quite sure. A bird in the wind. So this brings us around to the time we found out Robert Pattinson would be our next Batman. From what we know about the Batman, weird tourism and a bit of weirdness in the cape and cowl is exactly what the film needs. This is not going to be an early 2000s superhero flick. Rumored to follow the plot of The Long Halloween, this new Batman is more of a mob detective movie. Don't look for too many all-out brawls. Which is probably a good thing since Pattinson said that he doesn't plan to work out for the role. Ugh, perish the thought. With that in mind, Pattinson's unique filmography actually gives us a ton of evidence as to why he was perfectly cast. In the certified fresh high life, as an abandoned astronaut floating aimlessly in space, Pattinson showed his ability to be captivating in a psychological thriller. As the brooding young billionaire riding around New York for Cronenberg's Cosmopolis, he gives us a tiny peek into what he could bring to a young Bruce Wayne. And as the affluent pioneer bent on wooing his lady love no matter the cost for damsel, he shows us how he can portray Bruce Wayne's fanatical quest to seek justice by any means necessary. It's hard to know what made Matt Reeves think Pattinson would be perfect for the role, well, besides a killer jawline, but you can see how Pattinson gained an edge by simply being as weird as possible. And I mean, he was really weird. But again, being uber weird is something men who successfully don the cape and cowl kind of have in common. I mean, we get it. If you haven't been following his filmography and you heard the sparkle vamp was going to be Bruce Wayne, you were likely... Stop! <laughs> but very few people knew that Heath Ledger would be able to bring macabre gravitas to the Joker, that Michael Keaton could pull off the aloof and mysterious but ultra suave, sometimes love-struck billionaire, or that Hugh Jackman could give a character that he'd been playing for almost two decades the heartbreaking swan song of a warrior that's seen way too many battles. <sighs> Still makes me cry. We might have guessed that Ryan Reynolds could have quipped and joked his way to a pitch-perfect Deadpool, but we doubt even he thought it would be as awesome as it was. Chris Evans himself was doubtful in his ability to pull off the perpetually patriotic and wholesome Captain America. And thank God they convinced him otherwise, but does anyone remember the fact that it took Ryan Reynolds three films to get a quippy superhero performance to work? Just saying. More than anything, what makes Pattinson perfect for Batman is what he's not. Clooney, Kilmer, and Affleck brought plenty of star power, but they left fans and critics cold. From the drunken mermaid-loving lightkeeper, to the charismatic bank robber, to the criminal astronaut, to the hilariously offensive monarch, to the post-apocalyptic survivor who hums pop ballads, Pattinson has proved his dogged commitment to finding interesting characters no matter where they lie. And all that work solidified to make casting Pattinson as Batman a compelling and inspired choice right around the time that Warner Brothers was looking for a new young actor to play Bruce Wayne. Knowing all this, it kind of makes sense to cast a man who went on the Today Show and lied about dead clowns. First time I went to a circus, somebody died. One of the clowns <laughs> died. <laughs> and he totally lied about those dead clowns. Honestly, in the end, the only thing I'm looking forward to more than the film is Pattinson on the Batman press tour. That in the sex shop? That was not superhero. They've got a very pronounced gag reflex. 
I mean, Rafa named Big Big Tub. No, I just always thought, like, did you ever see this movie, Corky Romano? I used to be friends with all the, all the hookers who lived down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Let your freak flag fly, my boy. Let it fly.